These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even under the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Brother Rick, will you pray for us? Lord, I pray that you would just uh, bless the service tonight, Lord. Um, we thank you for everything we have. Thank you for <coughs> The gift of salvation. Thank you for the King James Bible. We pray that you would just help us to be edified tonight, Lord, and to go up, go out in a new direction than when we came in. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's focus on verse number 10. The Bible reads, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. <coughs> the title of the sermon this evening is The Wrath of God in the End Times. The Wrath of God in the End Times. And specifically we're going to be focusing on, of course, the wrath of God that is poured out and that we read about in the book of Revelation. Now, the world hates the topic of God's wrath because it is tied in with punishment and it is also tied in with justice. So likewise they hate the idea of hell also. They hate the idea of hell or they hate the idea of the lake of fire which is you know the final reckoning of God's wrath and it's the final reckoning of God's anger. And really when we look at hell <coughs> and we look at the lake of fire it is the ultimate manifestation of God's judgment and God's wrath being 
poured out. Now, I want to start out real simply before we actually get to the book of Revelation because, you know, there's a lot of things maybe that people may not understand, uh, you know, about this subject in particular because it is a doctrine that is taught throughout the Bible. I want to begin very simply with what does the word wrath mean? So turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter number 49. Genesis chapter number 49. We're going to be going back and spending most of our time in the book of Revelation. But first, let's begin here in Genesis chapter number 49. We'll get a, a definition of the word wrath. The Bible will define itself. This is only the second time or the second mention of uh, the word wrath in the Bible. It's only the second occurrence. And oftentimes, the very first time or the second time... When a word shows up in the King James Bible, it would define itself. Look here at verse number 7 in Genesis 49. The Bible reads, Cursed be their anger, and then it says this, For it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. A perfect definition of wrath is is anger. It is a more expanded uh, definition though if, if we were to say fierce anger. If you notice what he says there, he says cursed be their anger and then it says for it was fierce. So what wrath is, is it is anger but more specifically it is fierce anger. When we're talking about someone that is wrathful or someone that has wrath, we're not talking about someone that's just a little bit mad. We're not talking about someone that just has a little bit of anger. We are talking about someone that is extremely mad. Notice how it goes further. It says, <coughs> excuse me, and their wrath, it says, for it was cruel. So notice this is extreme anger. That's what wrath is. Wrath is when someone is very, very mad. Wrath is not a word that we will use very often today in 2020. The reason really is because we have such a minimal vocabulary. Everyone has such a very small uh, vocabulary today. And we don't really use words to express degrees. You know, we would just use mad all the time. If we were saying we're very mad, we'd just say, I'm very mad. Or if we were to say that we're just a little bit mad, we would just say, yeah, I'm just mad, right? Well, you know... It, people, that's because people today, you know, they've lost a lot of their smarts, if you will. People are not near as intelligent as they used to be, and everybody has such a limited vocabulary. What wrath actually means is that someone is very angry. That's what it means. I want you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter number 22, verse number 31. So I want to answer a couple of questions for you here in the beginning. Number one, what is the definition of wrath? It is extreme anger. That is the definition of wrath. It's, it's when someone is very mad. Number two, what is the purpose of God's wrath? This is the second question that I want to answer for you here early on in the sermon before we study God's wrath in the book of Revelation. What is the purpose of God's wrath? The answer is this. It is to recompense mankind for all of their wickedness. It is to recompense or to pay back mankind for all of their unrighteous deeds and all of the, the bad things that they have done. Ezekiel chapter number 22 verse number 31 says this, Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own, their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. So I want you to notice when God talks about pouring out His wrath, what does He say that He's doing? What's the purpose of it? He says, their own way have I recompensed upon their heads. So he's saying basically they lived a very wicked life. They lived a very sinful life and they did horrible things. And God paid them back. And the way in which he did that was with his wrath. With his anger. In his anger he paid them back. Also I want you to notice that wrath is used there with fire. Oftentimes it is used in the Bible with fire. As I said, and I want you to keep in mind, hell or the lake of fire is the ultimate manifestation of God's anger or of God's wrath. So, what is the purpose of God's wrath? It's the day where God finally rights all the wrongs. Right? It's the day where God finally judges. He recompenses mankind upon the earth. So, God's wrath is fulfilled uh, it's sp specifically in the end times. I want to answer a third question for you and then we're going to get into studying you know, uh, the end times revelation of God's wrath. Uh, go to John chapter number 3 verse number 36. John chapter number 3 verse number 36. This is the question. Who is God's wrath upon? Who are the people that God's wrath is upon? Who is God going to pour out His wrath upon in the end times? 
Romans chapter number 1 verse number 18 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So notice there we're given two parts. Number one it says it's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So that's God recompensing the, the evil that man has done, the sins that man has committed upon his own head. He's paying him back or he's judging man and punishing him for, for his sinfulness. But furthermore it says who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What's that talking about? That's talking about all the world that has heard the gospel. They've heard the truth of how to have their sins forgiven. They've heard the truth of the creation of Jesus Christ coming and being born of the virgin, of dying on the cross for the sins of the whole world, the gospel and the message of salvation, and they knew that it was the truth. And you know what they did? In their unrighteousness and in their sinful state, they rejected the gospel. They rejected the truth. That is who God is pouring out His wrath upon. Look at that in John chapter number 3, verse number 36. We'll see the same thing, just worded a little bit differently. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And then it says this, And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there we're given a very specific answer. And the very specific answer is anyone that has not put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ God's wrath abides upon them right then and there. And at the moment that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right then and there, God's wrath has now been passed from you. You are passed from death unto life. So anyone that is not saved, it's like God's wrath is just, is, is abiding. That means it's staying upon them. You know, I read for you from Romans chapter number 1 verse number 18 that begins to speak of how the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. If you uh, jump forward into Romans chapter number 2, it talks about, you know, all of those that God's wrath, how it abides upon them, those same people, and it speaks about how they are, they are just basically heaping up to themselves. They're storing up to themselves God's wrath against the day of wrath and the righteous judgment. So notice that. It's teaching the same thing, that God's wrath is abiding upon them. So, who is God punishing? Who is God's wrath going to be upon when we get to the book of Revelation and, and who God is going to be punishing in the end times? It's all of those that have rejected the gospel. It's all of those that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Even me, God's wrath was abiding upon me. Even you, God's wrath was abiding upon you at one time. But once you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's, God's wrath was appeased upon you. And that is because Jesus Christ took our punishment. He, he drank of the cup of, or he had it poured out upon him, of the wrath of God. So I want you to go ahead and turn back to the book of Revelation. Go back to where we began, <coughs> excuse me, the book of Revelation, specifically to Revelation chapter number 6. Now God has poured out his wrath upon uh, uh, mankind many times throughout history. Uh, he's done so specifically upon the nation of Israel over and over again, where God has visited them, God has judged them over and over again. <clears throat> and one of the, one of the uh, phrases that we'll find oftentimes that is associated with God's wrath is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not a good day. The day of the Lord is good for us in the book of Revelation, but when you read about the day of the Lord, 99% of the time, just in general, it's not a good day. It's usually not being brought up in a context of something positive. Now, the day of the Lord for us in Revelation chapter number 6 is a good thing, and that's because we're being saved out of it. But that is not primarily what it is about. The whole reason we're being saved out of it is because the day of the Lord is coming. And that phrase, the day of the Lord, uh, is also used to talk about the visitation of the Lord. It'll talk about how the Lord is going to be visiting the people. And the reason why he's visiting is he's not coming to pour out a blessing upon them. The Lord comes to the earth to judge them. That is why it's talking about him visiting or him coming down. It's the day of the Lord. It's the day where God visits 
all of man's unrighteousness and God punishes man and mankind for their unrighteousness. And this will happen, as I said many times throughout the Bible. The day of the Lord is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. But the ultimate fulfillment of the day of the Lord takes place in the book of Revelation and in the end times. This is God's ultimate day of the Lord. This is God's ultimate visitation upon mankind where he is going to, as I said, right all the wrongs. Where he's going to come down while man is on earth and he's going to set things straight and he's going to punish mankind while they're living on this earth. This begins, and we're told about this, in Revelation chapter number 6. Now if you remember... We studied about the tribulation just prior uh, uh, in some of the other little episodes within this series of end times. And we went through Revelation 6. And if you remember the first, the first six seals were basically about you know, uh, the tribulation. And, and, and until we actually got to uh, uh, really the sixth seal, the first five seals I guess you will, uh, were about the tribulation. Then the sixth seal is open, and when that is open, that is actually what initiates the day of the Lord. And I want to show you again that the day of the Lord has to do with God's wrath. Look at what it says in verse number uh, 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, watch this, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So this is actually the initiating of God's wrath. And notice, I want you to notice that it says, <clears throat> it's interesting, it says the great day of his wrath is come. So there were times where the Lord had the day of the Lord. And those days were the day of God's wrath. That's what it meant. The day of the Lord was the day where God visited and it was a day where he poured out his wrath, right? You could have called those, you know, the days of wrath. The days of the Lord's wrath, right? Would be very similar. But this was not just an average day like those days. This is the great day of wrath, if you will. Or this is the great day of the Lord. It's the ultimate fulfillment of all those days. A lot of those days were prophecies about the great day of God's wrath or the great day of the Lord that would come one day. So this is actually when God's wrath is being poured out in the end times upon the Antichrist kingdom, upon all the wickedness that mankind has committed. And he's going to uh, uh, you know, recompense specifically unto Israel or Jerusalem uh, much of the wickedness that they had committed in killing the prophets and, and all of that of the Old Testament. I want you to flip over to Revelation chapter number 8. So we're going we're gonna to jump right into and we're going to study God's wrath. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have a, a much better understanding of God's wrath when it's poured out. So notice that, that it, the day of the Lord, when it occurs in Revelation, it's the great day of the Lord. It's the great day of His wrath. So notice how it supersedes all of those other days. This is going to be, when you read about God punishing the world in the Old Testament, when you read about God punishing Israel and it's called the day of the Lord, that is nothing compared to what is coming. This is the great day of God's wrath or the great day of the Lord. And when we look at these punishments and these judgments, they supersede, they are so much more severe than what God has ever done to the earth. The things that are going to be happening, it would be even mild to refer to them as intense. It will be cataclysmic and catastrophic how God is going to just destroy and wipe out uh, the world. So God will be angry during this time. Remember, God's wrath refers to anger. I want you to look with me there at Revelation chapter number 8. <clears throat> Verse number 1, it says this, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and, and 
earthquake. Now I want you to get in your left hand. <coughs> I want you to flip over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3 real quick. Now I want you to notice there too as well. Keep in mind we were reading that just now. It's easy to kind of read over some of this stuff that is just kind of setting up the scene or the context. But it says that the angel took the censer and filled it with, the, with fire of the altar. So the angel goes over to the altar, right? And he has this, this incense. He takes the censer, that is what holds the incense, and he fills it with fire from the altar. So this thing is burning. It is on fire, right? It's filled with fire. The thing is, it's, it, it's a flame now on the end of it. And then he says this, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, what you just saw there, that was, that was basically you, you know, uh, being able to foresee what is about to take place. And that pictured God's wrath that is preparing to be poured out right now. I want to ask you this question. What was His wrath uh, uh, you know, represented by? What was it symbolized by when they threw it into the earth? It was symbolized by fire. Now, there was one other time where God punished the entire earth just like He will in the end times. Anybody remember when? Of course the flood. And how did he do so? What did he do when he destroyed the earth? With water. It was the flood. It flooded the entire earth. And what happened was people died by reason of water. It was the water. It caused them to drown and they died in the water. Now God you know, made a covenant that he would never flood the entire earth again. He would never judge and flood the entire earth again. Now, a lot of people probably took that. I'm sure there are very many Christians that misunderstand that. Of course, all the liberals would misunderstand it to think that God will never judge the whole earth again. And that's not true. God is going to judge the earth and the world again, the whole world, which is you know, the Antichrist kingdom in the end times. But He's not going to do so and destroy the whole world with water. He's going to do so... The opposite, he's going to do so with fire. So notice how he's, he's a little bit tricky there, if you will. So it's not that he's not ever going to judge the whole world again. He is going to judge the whole world again. He promised that he would never judge it and destroy it with water. But he never made a promise, did he, that he's not going to judge it or destroy it with fire. I want you to notice what it says here in 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 6. <coughs> Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. That's by His promise, right? Reserved, watch this, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Since the day of judgment is another thing that it's referred to as. Skip down to verse number 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Keep reading. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be <clears throat> in holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved." and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So once you notice that the day of the Lord, the day of God, the day of His return, all of that here, but, but the day of the Lord, it says in the very beginning of verse number 10, it, it is uh, uh, you know, categorized or explained by what's going to be taking place over and over and over again. What describes it? What's the description? Fire, dissolve, it's going to be burned up. Now, right now, as soon as we jump into studying God's wrath, and we see, you know, when He's preparing to right now begin to start pouring out His wrath, what does the angel do? Notice that. He goes over with the, the censer, which is what you, as I said, burn incense on, catches it on fire, and He throws it under the earth. Why? Because that is, how, that is what begins the day of the Lord. And I want to point something out to you that people may not have noticed. And, and, and I've heard a lot of weird teachings about what that's referring to when God's going to dissolve the earth, when He is going to destroy the earth. I've heard people talk about, yeah, that's later when God just like burns the entire earth up and then He, you know, he creates a totally different earth. That's not what that's talking about. It's the same type. It's being compared under the same type of judgment of Noah's day. Is that how He destroyed the earth then? And how he made a new earth then? Notice it said the earth that then was. That's talking about the earth before Noah's flood. And, and that, that implies that the earth that then was is not the same earth as of today. But let me ask you this question. Is it a totally just newly created earth? 
where God just, just out of nothing, right, just created a new earth. No, it's not. It is a reformed and refashioned earth because of God's judgment. Because He just destroyed the earth and, and reformed it and refashioned it because He judged it by water. Well, this is going to be the same thing. The new heavens and the new earth is just the earth that is after the judgment and the pouring out of God's wrath. So when does that fire take place? It takes place on when? Wouldn't it 2 Peter 3 say? The day of the Lord. We're studying the Bible. What does the Bible teach? The day of God, the day of Christ's return, the day of the Lord. You know, there's many different ways that it was worded. It said, hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Verse 10 said, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Well, when is that? That began in Revelation chapter number 6, right there at the end of Revelation chapter number 6, didn't it? Now, so it makes perfect sense when God is about to pour out His judgment. They're getting all the trumpets ready. What do they do? They take the censer, they light the censer, and what does He do immediately? He throws the fire from the altar onto the earth. Now, let me go ahead and, and give you a spoiler alert of every single one of God's judgments. I want you to go ahead and guess what every single one of them are. Do you think any of them are water? Every single one is God destroying the earth with fire. Every last one. So you know what it's talking about? He's talking about Him dissolving the earth, destroying the earth, burning the earth up. It's with the wrath of God that you read about with the seven trumpets and the seven vials. Let's get and jump right into this. Look at Revelation chapter number 8. We're going to keep reading here. <clears throat> One more time, uh, uh, well, we'll just skip, look at verse 6, we already read verse 5, it says, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Verse number 7, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Now what did 2 Peter chapter number 3 tell us was going to happen? It said the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It said that it, it'll be on fire and it will be dissolved. And it also said that things will be what? It said, and therein shall be burned up in the end of verse number 10. This is what this is referring to. Look at the second angel, verse number 8. <clears throat> And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Notice what happened there. For, uh, the very first trumpet, first God's wrath, what was it? It was God sending fire to the earth, and specifically it was fire mingled with blood. It says it was fire. He cast fire upon the earth. It was hail and fire mingled with, with blood. So these massive you know, hailstones, if you will. And they're on fire. And they're probably just massive. And they are just, you know, you know, just dropping down upon the earth. And they're mingled with blood. Then the second angel, when it sounded, it says there's a great mountain burning with fire that was cast into the sea. So it's like a great mountain. So it's probably something along the lines of what we would think of like a meteorite, right? It's, a mountain is normally, you think of something that's rocky. That's what I imagine when it talks about a great mountain. This could possibly even be some sort of meteorite that, that God, you know, detours, you know, like He prepared a great fish for Jonah. He might prepare a great, you know, meteorite to just blast the earth, specifically where the sea is located. And when this, this particular you know, uh, great mountain, or maybe meteorite as I said, hits the earth, it says it is burning with fire. So it's on fire. And as a result of that, <coughs> it says it was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is massive. And maybe something that it's mingled with, maybe the fact that the temperature is so hot that it burns things up in the sea. But either way, as a result of this, this massive meteor, a great mountain, it says that a third, so one third of the creatures which were in the sea, so in the, in the ocean, right, in the sea, that had life, died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. This also could, because it's so huge, it could have caused some sort of like tsunami when it just you know, you know, struck the ocean, it could have just thrown everything everywhere, just, you know, knocked the ecosystem, uh, as far as it comes to marine life, all out of whack, just killing all the different fish, you know, just throwing everything out of whack and just destroyed the, the obviously the ships wouldn't stand a chance, and it caused 
a third part of the ships also to be destroyed. Look at verse number 10. And the third angel. <coughs> and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven. Watch this. Burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. So notice that he's trying to direct all of this to the waters. First he targets the sea. And a third part of the creatures that are in the sea die. And then also a third part of the ships are destroyed. Now it says that when, it, when the third angel sounds... A great star from heaven. This could also be something like we think like a meteorite or something along those lines. Or it could just be describing something that's close to that for us to understand. It says a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. So notice again it's fire. Burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. So maybe once this, this star is coming down, maybe it starts to disperse when it hits our atmosphere. And then it's just spreading its way out and God's guiding it and directing it and it's just hitting all of the different rivers and all of the different fountains of waters. Why is he doing this? He, God is destroying and polluting all of the drinking sources. That's what he's doing. He's trying to torment and punish the kingdom of the beast. So he's just destroying all the waters. All of the food that's found in the marine life. He is just making their lives a living hell, literally, where they're just not able to eat anything. They're not able to drink anything. It's going to cause an even worse famine than what was previous in the Great Tribulation. I mean, this is obviously supernatural. And this is, as I said in the beginning of the sermon, cataclysmic. It is just catastrophic. Notice again, I want, to, I want you to make sure that you're catching this. Over and over and over again, every one of the judgments, what is it? It's burning. It's fire, just as 2 Peter 3 told us. Look at uh, verse number uh, 12. <clears throat> and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. And the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Now that is a scary announcement because God has just punished the earth like he has never punished the earth before on a, a level that is just insane. Now obviously when he flooded the earth that was terrible but it was just rain coming down it was a slow you know uh, occurrence when the, the you know when the flood came and I'm sure obviously you know there was water that came out of, as we all believe, I believe, uh, uh, waters came out of the earth. And maybe that sped things up. But it was much more, you know, natural. It was much more, you know, just uh, uh, something that we observe every day. It wasn't anything like, you know, striking a third part of the, you know, marine life and killing them. It wasn't anything like, you know, a third part of ships being destroyed, you know, just in a minute from a judgment. You know, it wasn't anything like, you know, hail and fire mingled with blood. And now there's an announcement in verse number 13. It says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And then he says this, By reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So what he's warning you about is, like, you need to be very scared of the... You think that was bad, basically? Do you think those four Trumpets were bad? You haven't seen anything yet. These next three are going to be a lot, lot worse. So notice, after those four, which are, are just already supernatural, they're crazy, they're severe and intense, he says, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Look at chapter number 9, verse number 1. And the fifth angel sounded... And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. Notice, you know, tying it in with fire and things like that, but keep reading. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green <coughs> thing, uh, neither... 
any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as, a, as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns of light gold and their faces were as the faces of men and they had <coughs> hair as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle and they had tails like unto scorpions and, they were, and there were stings in their tails and their power was to hurt men five months and they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon one woe is past, behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. <clears throat> and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstones. Brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. See that keep reoccurring. Verse 18. By these three was the third part of men killed. By the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and then so forth and so forth. I want you to skip ahead. I want to go to chapter number 11. So that was the sixth uh, trumpet that was blown. We're going to look at the seventh trumpet. Now we're not given a lot of information right here about the seventh trumpet, but I'll, I will get to that here in just a minute. But look at chapter number 11, verse number 14, and then I want to go over another misunderstanding about the wrath of God. <clears throat> look at uh, chapter number 11, verse number 14. The Bible says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded... And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Now, if we look there, and I'm not going to delve too much into this because I'm going to actually devote a sermon to the judgment of the great whore. That is what takes place here with the seventh uh, angel sounding the trumpet. That is the final judgment that is poured out upon the judgment of the great whore. And it's where it's specifically you know, uh, focused and, and, and centralized as far as God's wrath on the city of Jerusalem or the, the great whore. When you look at the earthquake and all of that taking place, we compare that unto Revelation chapter number 16. That is when the seventh vial is poured out as well. The earthquake takes place and it is the judgment of the great whore. You jump into chapter number 17 and the angel says, hey, let me show you the judgment of the great whore. We get in, excuse me, to chapter number 18 and we read about the judgment of the great whore. And do you know how the great whore dies? You know how she's destroyed? She's burned with fire. That's what it tells you in Revelation 17. That's what you read about in Revelation chapter number 18. So notice all of the different judgments of God, every last one of them all the way there to the end is what? It's related to fire every single time. So how is God judging the world in the day of the Lord when He comes back? What is His wrath? What is it referring to in 2 Peter chapter number 3? It's talking about God judging the world by fire when the wrath of God as far as the trumpets are blown are blown. Now, the other time that we see the the wrath of God being being uh, uh, recorded or talked about is 
going to be Revelation chapter number 16. Revelation chapter number 16 and it, all of it is contained therein. It's all in that one chapter. I want you to go to, keep one hand in Revelation chapter number 8 and I want you to flip over, <coughs> excuse me, to Revelation chapter number 16 with your other hand. Now, <coughs> excuse me, I realize that many people believe that uh, there are actually two different judgments that are taking place simultaneously. Many people that have studied and made timelines and things you know, about the wrath of God being poured out, they will read about the trumpets being blown in the first half of the book of Revelation, and then they'll read about the vials being poured out in the second half of the book of Revelation, and they will separate these or differentiate the one from the other and they believe that these are two separate wraths that are being poured out. They're two separate judgments that are being poured out. And some will say maybe that they're kind of happening one right after the other. Some will say that they're simultaneous, but, ba but that they are the, the same, or I'm sorry, not the same, and that they are happening separately. They are independent from one another. Now, what I'm going to show you right now is what I believe about this. I, I think that it's pretty clear that the trumpets and the vials are the same judgment. I believe that it is the one and the same judgment. I think that this is obvious uh, to start with. Number one, we're going to see uh, by comparing the two. Uh, when we look at these, there are going to be subtle differences. But when we look at the Gospels, there are also what? Subtle differences, aren't there? There are stories that are told in, 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 in the book of Matthew, and then there are stories that are told in the book of Mark, and you have different details that are given with both, right? And there will be little small differences, but it's the record of the same story. Now when we look at the book of Revelation, we cut the book of Revelation in half. We know that there were, right where we were reading a moment ago in chapter number 11, is where the first half or the first record of the end times wraps up, isn't it? When we get to Revelation chapter number 11, you know, we've already went through the tribulation, the rapture took place, and then, all, and then God's wrath is poured out. So that's one record of God's wrath taking place. Then we get into Revelation 12, 13, 14. We see you know, the rapture take place in 14, 15. We see the song of Moses and everyone in heaven, the 144,000. And then we get back to Revelation chapter number 16 with the wrath of God being poured out again. You know what we have? We have two different records of what is going to take place in the end times. And in Revelation chapter number 8 through 11, what we just read about was the first record of the wrath of God being poured out. And what we're getting ready to read about right now is just the second record of the wrath of God being poured out. But guess what? It's the same wrath. And there are the same judgments. And there are seven judgments in the end times that God is going to judge the earth with. And they're the same. And I'm going to show that to you right now. I want, to I want you to see these side by side. This is very much a Bible study to help us just grow in knowledge of the wrath of God when it's poured out. So get Revelation chapter number 8 in your left hand. Get Revelation chapter number 16 in your right hand. First we'll begin with Revelation chapter number 8. Look at verse number 7. We read this a moment ago. It says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. So there we're given some of the details of what's going to happen when this judgment takes place in the first record. I want you to look at the second record. Look at Revelation chapter number 16, verse number 2. And the first went, now this is the vial. This is one of the vials that's recorded in Revelation 16, the seven vials. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And then it says in verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. So there we, I accidentally read ahead in verse number 3, but... There we see, we're not given a lot of details about the very first trumpet, are we? And this is the only one that we're not really told much about. All it tells you is there was an anointsome, grievous sore that fell upon the men. That's all that we're told uh, in verse number 2 about the first vial. Now we're given more specific details about the first trumpet in Revelation chapter number 8. But I want you to look at the second trumpet. Look at Revelation 8, verse 8. It says, And the second angel sounded... And as it were a great mountain 
burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now look over at Revelation chapter 16. Look at the second vial. Revelation 16, 3 it says, And the second angel poured out his vial, watch this, upon the sea. Just like the second trumpet. And it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. So I want you to notice how similar that both of these are. Now one of them could have been recording it from the beginning account of when the trumpet was blown and things begin to die and then the other could be recording the conclusion of it. And both of them are both affecting the sea. Now I want you to go to, let's look at the third trumpet. Go to Revelation chapter number 8 again. Look at verse number 10. It says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. waters. And, and it says in verse 11, And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many died of the waters because they were made bitter. Look over at Revelation chapter 16 verse 4. It says, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters. Notice, it's identical. And they became blood. And then he says in verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. Now let's go back. Let's look at the, the, uh, 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 the fifth trumpet. Look at Revelation chapter number... Uh, I'm sorry, the fourth. Look at Revelation chapter number 8, verse number 12. The fourth trumpet. Revelation chapter number 8, verse number 12 says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. And the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Flip over now to Revelation chapter number 16, verse number 8. It says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. Notice that. <clears throat> And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now when we look at the trumpet that is blown, in the fourth trumpet in the first account of Revelation chapter number 8, all that it tells you is that the third part of the sun was smitten. So it tells you that it affects the sun and it tells you that it affects the moon, right? Now, when we compare that unto the fourth trumpet, or the fourth, the fourth trumpet unto the fourth vial, which takes place in Revelation 16.8, notice that the fourth vial is also affecting the sun, but it gives us a little bit more detail, and it says that the power was given unto him, to this angel that poured out his vial upon the sun, to scorch men with fire. Right? Verse number 9, And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give Him glory. So notice how similar one after the next is. I want you to look with me at the fifth trumpet now, Revelation chapter number 9, look at verse number 13. Revelation chapter number 9, verse number 13 says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, and saying to the sixth angel which had the sixth trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the river Euphrates. So these four angels are bound in the river Euphrates, and it says to loose them. So they're, they're loosened. Look over at Revelation chapter number 16, verse number 12, at the sixth vial. So that was the sixth trumpet, loosing the four angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. Look at Revelation chapter number 16, verse number 12. <clears throat> it says this, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. Watch this. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, notice how it tells you different records. Now, God, when He does things, He often does things for multiple purposes. And I'll give you a perfect example. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth to be born as a man, what was the number one reason that He came here for? To die for the sins of the whole world. He had to become a man so He could take the punishment of man. So He could die for the sins of the whole world. But you know another reason why He came to this earth was so that he could, he could uh, uh, become an example for us, right? He could, he could be an example for us and show us things on how we should live our lives. You know, another reason why he came to this earth is so that he could be our mediator, so that he could you know, understand what it was like and so that he could sympathize with us 
Like it says in Hebrews, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So that he could understand and go through the things that we go through. So notice how there's multi-purposes there because God is so wise, his thoughts are above our thoughts. God will do things for multiple reasons and multiple purposes.